in the middle of this, like, oh, I'm having a great time and I'm definitely like, you know, partaking in the whole thing. But there's a part of me that's like, what the fuck? This is, this is nuts. My life is crazy right now. Hi, I'm Gracie Mercedes and welcome back to Not Blank Enough, a podcast about everyday insecurities and triumphs. In this episode, I'm talking with my husband, Damien Fahey. The radio host, former MTV VJ and Family Guy writer, talks about how he got into radio at a very young age, what it was like working at MTV, and how Twitter got him his first writing job. We also share how we met and his struggles with imposter syndrome. This and more on this special episode we titled Not Confident Enough. And stay tuned for an afterthought from me after the episode. Well, hello, Damien, and welcome to Not Blank Enough. Thank you, Gracie. <laughs> <laughs> this is so, so weird. This is so weird. For those who don't know, Damien is my husband. We are recording from two separate rooms in our house right now. <laughs> I'm in my bedroom closet. I'm in my uh, my office closet. Mm -hmm. And I thought it would be fun to to talk to Damien and get to know him a little better. Well, I guess get the let the audience know you a little better. I know you pretty well, but who knows? Maybe I'll learn something new. Yeah, who knows? Um, so let's start by you telling us a little bit about yourself, like what you do and how you got to do it. And then we'll chat about your blank. Sure. Well, right now I am a writer on Family Guy. I'm also a part-time radio host on a radio station out here called My FM. And uh, those are kind of my two main gigs at the moment. And I came to those sort of different, you know, in different ways. But I started out, I guess I'll sort of start way back in the day mm -hmm. when I was 13 or 14. And I saw on C-SPAN was, was simulcasting a radio show which means they were just, they had a camera in a radio studio. And I don't know what it was, but it was just like a bolt of lightning came out of the sky and like hit me. And I was like, that's it. That's what I want to do. I want to do everything that's happening that I see on television. And so I built a home studio. At age 13. Yeah, 13. at age 13. I had my mom empty my savings account, drive me to Radio Shack, buy all of like the equipment <laughs> and everything. And I built this awesome studio in my bedroom. And I would have friends over, we would do radio shows and, you know, I would write scripts and I would write comedy bits and we would make prank phone calls. And, you know, all these, you know, shows are on cassette tape in my mom's condo in Massachusetts <laughs> right now, which I have to listen to and like transfer over to digital because I'm so curious. So anyway, so I did that for a while. And then I just kind of like everything, I kind of want to graduate to the next level of whatever I get interested in. And so that became getting to, to work at a real radio station. So I opened up the phone book, you know, there was no internet, Well, there was internet, but the, you know, the phone book was easier back then to, uh, to find radio stations. So I found three radio stations. I took tours of two of them. I asked to be an intern at two of them. They said, no, too young. You have to be getting, you know, college credit. And then at the third one I asked and they said, you know what? They saw like I was really into it. I was really eager. The promotions director is like, what are you doing on, uh, this is during the summer. What are you doing on Monday? You know, would you like to come in here and watch the, you know, shadow the midday DJ, you know, during his shift for a couple hours? And I freaked out and it was like, it was like, I was so excited. I got really, really excited about that. So I said, yeah, absolutely. And so I just sort of became a fixture at the radio station from that point on. I was, whether it was shadowing v uh, DJs or getting them coffee, printing out materials they need for their shows, you know, uh, uh, burning CDs, whatever it was, I was doing it, you know. And then I would sort of sneak in to the off-air studio. I'd have my dad drive me on Thursday evenings to work there for like, I don't know, three or four hours from like six to 10 at night. And I would just go in the off-air studio called the production studio and I would work on my demo tape to give to the program director because I'm like, I'm gonna make a demo tape and it's gonna be really good and I'm gonna work on it for like six months and then when it gets to where I want it, I'm gonna slide it under the program director's door. He's gonna hear it and he's gonna give me a job. Well, he did. <laughs> You're still 13 at this point, right? No, now I'm like, now I'm like 14, 15, but I'm in high okay. school. I, I slip the tape under the door. I get a phone call from the program director and he goes, hey, what are you doing this Saturday night from midnight to 6 a.m.? Our overnight guy can't do it. I heard your demo. It sounds really good. I'd love to put you on. And there's no way this was legal, right? No, this is all, <laughs> this is breaking all sorts of Massachusetts child labor laws for sure. But the important thing is, is I'm not going to tell because it's literally all I want to do with my life. Like everything in my life, I was like a laser focused, you know, human being, everything else fell by the wayside. 
All I wanted to do was be in a radio studio and talk on the radio and play music. You're talking in your radio voice. It's hilarious. As you tell this story, you're telling it in your radio voice. That's so funny. Yeah, I do have a radio <laughs> voice that I put on. I don't know. When I talk about radio, I get very serious about it. <laughs> so I do my radio voice. Well, basically, I know what happens. I mean, you basically worked in radio forever and then you went to college. You were still working in radio and yes. the whole MTV thing happened. But before we get to that, I want to talk a little bit about your childhood sure. and what that was like and, you know, what kind of school you went to and how you felt at school and maybe what your not blank enough was when you were like a kid. I had a great childhood. I mean, I, I have really fond memories of my childhood. I mean, obviously, there's some stuff with like my parents that sort of comes up and has, has come up like in recent years, you know, since getting into therapy, I've sort of peeled back the layers of like, oh, there was a lot of yelling in my house and there was a lot of fighting and there was always a lot of tension and, and there were like sort of things unsaid. And, and so that sort of uh, colored, I think, you know, my, my childhood. But I, I think back, you know, the majority of my childhood was really like super, I guess they call them free range. How annoying is that? Free range kids. Uh, I had a free range childhood. Like, you weren't home much. Like, yeah, I wasn't home much. I mean, I like, you know, I play a lot of video games, watch a lot of television and stuff. But for the most part, I was on my bike or I was, you know, over friends' houses and like, you know, I was super into WWF. And so, you know, we were like wrestling in the front yard or, you know, digging holes or playing with, <laughs> you know, trucks or whatever. You know, it was just a very like down and dirty kind of fun, super, super fun childhood. And that all sort of changed when we moved and I was about 13, 12, 13, we moved to this from, from Chicopee, Massachusetts, which is a very blue collar town to a more affluent part of Massachusetts, Long Meadow, Massachusetts. That is, it's all white people playing lacrosse, basically. Like that was the big thing. It was like, you know, you want to be on the lacrosse team because they're super good. And, and that was sort of like the culture. So I went from like this kind of fun, creative kind of like school environment to this very sports centric environment that I just did not fit me at all. So I started, I immediately felt like a fish out of water and I didn't really know how to relate to the other kids. Cause, and I, and this comes up at work too. And like, you know, when the guys talk about sports at work, you know, there's a lot of sports fans at family guy mm. and it's sort of like, Whoa, I don't really have anything to add to this because I'm, uh, I'm not a sports fan, you know, like I'm not, you know, I'm, I, I, ha I have been in the past, but it's like, I'm just not really into sports. And how did that make you feel as a kid? It made me feel like an outsider. Yeah. And I think it also like when I feel that way, I have a tendency to totally shut down mm. and I get really hard on myself. I start to have thoughts like, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you into sports? You know, why aren't you like these other guys? Why aren't you more like a man? You know, why, why do you why are you more interested in like music and, uh, you know, other things that aren't like. So there was that like gender normative, what a man should like and do and be. Yeah. Kind of sounds like it was like. I don't know, affecting you a little bit as a kid. And then, so if you had to pick a blank, what, what would it have been like not manly enough or not boyish enough? Like, what would it be? I think it would probably be not cool enough because <laughs> all of the uh, sports guys were like cool. And, and, and as much as I shut down, there was a part of me that was like, I really want to be friends with these people. I really want to be one of them. And I think for a long time, I disappeared into radio and um, well, well, when I first got there, I tried to, you know, I played basketball for like a couple of years and stuff. And I tried to sort of, you know, ingratiate myself into that like culture. And I just realized like, you know, it got to a point where I was like, I, this isn't for me, you know, this isn't like, this isn't me. Yeah. And yeah. so I think at a certain point, and I think it happened. I remember the moment it actually happened. I went to UMass basketball camp because I'd been playing basketball for, you know, a couple of years and I was pretty good in town, you know, and then I went to UMass basketball camp and my parents dropped me off. I'm laughing because I know this. Story. Yeah, you know this story. <laughs> First of all, my intramural long meadow basketball team was just all, you know, white kids mm -mm. And, and kind of doughy white kids, like not athletic. Mm -hmm. But. So I went to uh, I went to UMass basketball camp and the second I stepped onto like the campus, I was like, whoa, all right, this is not going to go well. Kids were just bigger. They were like stronger. They were like, you know, cooler. And then, of course, there was like a uh, like a scrimmage, you know, like the day one sort of like we have a game at four o'clock and I suited up, you know, and I was like, I don't know, God, a hundred and, you know, 50 pounds, six foot two. And I suited up in like my UMass basketball jersey that my parents bought me from, you know, champ sports or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I got on the court and immediately 
like got dunked on. Like it was just like a complete, <laughs> just like a complete, like I was so humiliated, just like completely humiliated. And I somehow finished the game and I went back to the dorm. And of course the only person like who befriended me was like this other kid who was like a total like nerdy dude. Right. And we were, we were just talking. We, we, I remember just us talking about anything but basketball. You know, we were just talking about like, you know, music and, and stuff like that. Did you stick it out? Did you leave? I no, no, no. I, I called my parents and I'm like, you got to get me out of here. Because I th <laughs> it was like a week. It was like a 14 day like thing. And I'm like, oh, I'm not going to last here. Like, the, And it was also just like at that moment, I realized I don't want to. I think I convinced myself maybe I could be like a professional basketball player. Oh, wow. I'm completely delusional. And in that moment, I was like, oh, need to find another thing I'm good at. And so that became... I think from that humiliating experience where my ego was just like totally shattered because I was a pretty good basketball player in my hometown. I had to sort of pick up the pieces and funnel that energy into something else that I knew I could be good at. And when I saw that, you know, C-SPAN show, I was like, this is it. I can sit and talk on a, on a microphone and play music. Yeah. So maybe it was also not athletic enough. Yeah. Not athletic enough. That's a good tool. Yeah. That's a good one, too. Yeah. And so, okay, so then we're jumping around a little bit, but now going back um, to college, you are working as a DJ in Massachusetts when someone suggests that you try out because MTV was like in town looking for VJs and they were looking at DJs to be on camera, basically, and you wanted nothing to do with it, which yeah, of course true. is probably why you got it. Um, but <laughs> tell that story real quick. Sure. So I was doing part time at Kiss 108 in Boston. You know, I, I went from market number 80 in Springfield, Massachusetts, to sending a, a CD demo to a program director in Boston, market number eight. And I got the gig. And so all I wanted to do was be full time at Kiss 108 in Boston. And so when someone said, uh, and I was fresh off the heels of a very, you know, humiliating, another one of those sort of UMass basketball e ego shattering moments where I, I auditioned for a local television show and it just went really, really poorly. And so I was, you know, I just remember swearing off television. I'll never, all I want to do is radio. I never should have tried to, you know, host a television show. It's radio, radio, radio. And so when the MTV thing happened a few months later, and uh, the um, the promotions director said, hey, you know, MTV's looking for a VJ. They, they've been all over the country. They can't seem to really find someone that they really like. And they're going to come to the station next week. And I think you have a really cool look, you have an MTV kind of a look. And I think it'd be <laughs> worth it for you to, to try out. Will you try out? And I said, no. I, I said, I just got so freaking humiliated with my last television audition that I really don't want to experience that again. It was super painful. And so she goes, she convinced me, this, this woman, Amy, she said, uh, look, just, just, just do it, do it for me. And I'm like, okay, fine. And so I, I did it and I auditioned in the basement of the radio station and I immediately, like the second it started, I was like this, it was another bolt of lightning. I was like, I want to do this. This is really great. This is fun. I'm good at this. What did you love about it so much? First of all, I liked being in front of a camera and I liked sort of improv and being funny and being silly and like showing off like a part of my personality that I really didn't get to show off on the radio. Mm. On the radio, you it's all about expressing yourself within like eight seconds before, you know, the singer starts singing the song or 10 seconds or 15. And so this was like, here's a minute and a half. Do with it what you want. Make us laugh. Have fun. And I was like, oh, this is great. This is so much fun. And then, of course, you know, in the back of my mind, the carrot that was sort of like dangling was the fact that like, oh, in New York, there's this show called TRL hosted by this guy, Carson Daly. Who also came from radio. Who also came from radio. Yeah. And so it was sort of like this light at the end of the tunnel. I was sort of like, wow, maybe, you know, you start to dream like, oh, wow, maybe that could be me one day. <laughs> and, and it wasn't even clear that they were looking for someone to replace Carson. But it was just like, OK, this is this is cool. It got me really excited. And so I finished the audition and I felt great about it. And I, there were two people there casting people. And they were like, this was really good. You did a really good job. We're going to make sure that the boss sees this. It was really good. We've looked all over and we, this is just, you know, this is exactly what we're looking for. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> so I get in my car, I get my Geo Prism mm -hmm. LSI, the, you know, cause I had the sunroof. So that was the LSI. Okay. Version. Keep going. <laughs> and so I get in my Geo Prism and I drive back to my apartment and I'm driving sort of way at a stop sign under the bridge, under a bridge. The car in front of me has a license plate. And I've told this story before. It was sort of like 475, you know, 4, 4752 VJ. And I was like, whoa, 
And I don't believe in it's you know. A sign. Yeah, I thought in that moment while I was literally so you know full sign. of adrenaline, I was like, it's literally this is a sign from somewhere, mm-hmm. <laughs> the TV gods, that this is going to happen. So I ended up uh, emailing the casting people over and over, kind of relentlessly for a couple months, <laughs> which in some cases would make you lose a job. But yeah. for some, some reason it worked for you. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what it was. I mean, I, and I had this sort of like tenacity when I was younger, when I wanted something, I would just go full force and like, I'm like, I'm going to get it. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, mm-hmm. or I'm, if I don't get it, I'm, I'm going to leave no cards on the table. I'm going to, you know, totally go for it. They made you sweat it out for a while though, right? You, yeah. You they made me sweat it out for, for a while. Yeah. They made it sort of for a while. So I'd, I'd email and literally I'd get emails back going, you know, nope, not yet. Nothing yet. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll email you if we hear anything. And then I just sent another email, like, you know, in a week and a half, like I haven't heard anything. And then when did you finally find out? And then I found out the day I had to call my parents and tell them I, I forgot to, to register for the next semester of college, you know, classes. And they told me, uh, they said, hey, we'd love to. Oh, we'd how love- Damien of you. <laughs> it's so Damien. I know. I know. That morning I was super, super stressed. And then I got the email from MTV Casting and they said, we want to, you know, fly you out to New York, put you up and have you audition in New York City. So when you say audition in New York City, it was more like a, a screen test, right? Like you were actually doing stuff at that point? It was a callback. Or, oh, it was just a callback. Okay, got it. And then after the callback, when did you find out you got it? Like, when did you find out for real you got it? Uh, it I say, so the first audition was the radio station, then a callback in, in New York. And then there was a, in, in what was called the downtown studio. TRL was in the uptown studio. There was also a midtown studio separating both of them. So I, I did one in the downtown studio. And then I went back to New York. And that's when I went to the uptown studio, the actual TRL studio. That was when they put me in full wardrobe, makeup, teleprompter, it was it was it was the closest thing to actually going on the air. Mm-hmm. And that's when I knew, oh, shit, I'm getting very, very, very close to this. Like, this is within reach now. This is really pretty exciting and scary. And then I found out and then I found out after that last uh, callback, I found out, went back to Boston and I was at my parents house for the weekend. I had driven home from college and I Got a call on my cell phone from Vinny Potasivo, who is the head of casting. And he said, um, you're going to be getting a phone call in about 10, 15 minutes from this guy, Rod Asa, who is the uh, head of talent. And he said, you're, he's going to be he's going to offer you a, a summer VJ job, you know, sort of a, a trial period. And it's it's going to you know begin in June, this June. I really, you know, it was like, <laughs> it was, yeah, I can still remember it. But it's you know, one of those moments. And then, of course, of course, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes later, Rod Asa calls me and he goes, hey, Rod Asa here. And uh I'm head of, you know, head of casting, head of talent here at MTV. And we'd loved your tape and the bosses loved your tape. And we'd love to have you for the summer if you're, you know, willing to do that. And I, you know, and that was sort of, that was sort of it. And what year was this? 2002? This was 2002. Yeah. So to set the stage at the, 2002, you get this amazing job. You leave college, you leave the radio station, you come to New York and I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're definitely there. So those who don't know, I think I talked about this before on the podcast. But I'm not sure. I interned at MTV News in college and right out of college, started working at ABC News. This is back when I thought I wanted to be a reporter or, you know, like anchor woman. ABC News was just like just too crazy and depressing. Like world news was a lot. <laughs> Local news was a lot. <laughs> and so after working at ABC News, I decided to go back to MTV News. They took me in and gave me a job, but everything there at the time was freelance. And so I, I, I worked on a show for a couple of weeks and then I kind of bounced around and then eventually ended up in MTV production. And back then, MTV production did things like Say What Karaoke with our mutual friend Dave Holmes hosting. And there was TRL and then there was spring break shows and we had all our VJs and we had summer, you know, the summer houses and all that stuff. And so I had started as a PA, worked my way up to like an associate producer and then a producer. I remember when when I got there, Damon was not there yet. Carson was our main host. I can't even remember who else was there besides Carson and Dave Holmes. But then around the time you came, we also got Caduce and then like Vanessa and Susie and all these like new VJs were were sprouting up, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because they all came after you, right? Well, Caduce was there before me, but Carson was sort of he had the late night show on NBC, and so he was sort of you know leaving slow. It was a slow sort of exit from. MTV. Yeah. And so they were like, we need the next Carson. And and Caduce was already there then? Okay, yeah. So Caduce and Caduce was, was already, was already there. there. And yeah. Lala was already there. And Lala was already there too, yeah. 
So, you know, there was a lot of you guys. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. Great and fun. And so I was about the same age as all, all of you guys, you know, younger than some, older than some. But everyone at MTV was like in their 20s and 30s. So it was, it was totally. kind of a party town. Like it was yeah. like being in college, but getting paid for it. We worked hard. We played hard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we all slept with each other. <laughs> and we all slept with each other. Oh, my God. That's the sort of truth. It's like this is just I mean, it was a it was an HR nightmare. You know, Yeah, this was before Me Too movements. Oh, it yeah. Wasn't, it wasn't in a sleazy way, like because there were so many women. In yeah. fact, the women were often the bosses. Totally. And it was such a like diverse environment. Like MTV back then, you know, it, it's changed so much. And now all the programming is like scripted and, and, and done out of house. Like it's no longer within the MTV family. But back then, like we made everything that was on the channel. And we were all 20s and 30s. We were lots of females. There was, you know, every kind of ethnicity, every kind, you know, LGBTQ. Like it was just like, it was a melting pot of young creatives yeah. making stuff. And yes, everyone was dating everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of yeah. PAs were dating other PAs and producers dating producers and producers dating uh, VJs and VJs dating <laughs> yeah. and VJs dating celebrities and everyone was dating everybody. But you and I didn't really date. I mean, we could, we kissed a couple of times yeah. back then. Yeah, uh, we didn't like, we didn't, yeah, we didn't, we didn't date. We, we had definitely... a little down low relationship. Yeah, totally. But then... We reconnected many years later, or not that many years, I guess like four or five years later, while you were still at MTV. So you were at MTV for seven years? Seven or eight years, yeah. You went on to host TRL once Carson left, and you, know, you were the main dude. And then I left MTV, I think somewhere in like 2005, so maybe three years after you got there. That's about right, yeah. And then we reconnected. Mm-hmm over myspace because that's how old we are jesus yeah you reached out to me on myspace i think it was like 2007 yeah we started a long distance relationship from new york la i was in la by the way yes i moved to la and you were still in new york doing trl and then started dating and then eventually you moved. i went back to new york for a year you came back here with me and got married and the rest is history but you know, MTV was our foundation and uh, and uh, Dave Holmes, MTV VJ, married us. Yeah. Isn't that cute? And he's been a guest on this. Uh... He was. He was one of our early guests on this podcast. Yeah, he was and great. he was wonderful. Yep. So going back to the theme of the show. So you're seven years at MTV. When you first get there, were you freaking out? Were you nervous? Yeah. I do recall you telling me you were like puking every day. Yeah. So I wake up and puke every morning. Yeah. I mean, you know, almost every morning. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What was that like? That sounds terrible. And literally just like not puking up anything, you know, because I'm too nervous to eat. So, you know, there's nothing to puke up. So you just. Oh, puke. Yeah, okay. I know. I think we know. It's the first time we've ever <laughs> talked about this on a, on your podcast, I'm sure, you know. The, yes, it is. But yeah, no, I was super, super nervous. And I somehow I, I coped with it. I think there was a part of me that didn't needed to to survive this, not fully download or experience or have like the perspective of like how large of a fucking deal this mm. this was. I think I minimized a lot of it. And I think I sort of like normalized, convinced myself that like, you know, you know, on uh, I, yes, of course, Jennifer Lopez, Madonna, Diddy, Britney Spears, and then Justin Timberlake, you know, that was my afternoon. That's a normal afternoon. <laughs> and then you go out at night and it's like, of course, Lindsay Lohan, you know, I'm at Lindsay Lohan's uh, table at, you know, a nightclub in New York. And she's, you know, we're I'm doing shots with her and, and Ashley Simpson. And, you know, it's like, it's all this is it's it's it was this crazy ride. I mean, I I, <laughs> I think it's probably like people who've been in giant bands, you know, like it's it was sort of the same kind of a thing. So it was so at times so chaotic, so surreal, so crazy. And and I'm in the middle of this, like I'm I'm having a great time and I'm definitely like, you know, partaking in the whole thing. But there's a part of me that's like, I was, you know, what the fuck? This is this is nuts. And it's like my life is yeah. crazy right now. I'm in magazines, yeah. I'm being photographed, I'm being stopped on the street, I'm having taken pictures lot. with people. Yeah. <laughs> it's really crazy. And I'm not, you know me. I'm not the kind of guy who likes to be the center of like, you know, when I go, when I leave the house, I don't need everyone to, you know, to, to notice me. And, and I'm the opposite of that. And I should probably like set the stage for people once again, like this is the 2000s and in New York now different from L.A., but in New York. We don't have a ton, uh, or at least back then, we didn't have like a ton of like film and television happening there. But MTV was like a New York staple. Yeah. And that's where all the celebrities came to plug their stuff. 
And that's where, you know, and all the VJs became huge names. And New York's a small city when you really, you know, when you really break it down, like Mm. there's only so many bars and restaurants anyone's going to at one time. And so MTV became this like, oh my God, this like really big deal in New York. So anyone who worked at MTV, anyone who was on air at MTV, like you were like a huge celebrity in New York, especially. Yeah. I remember sometimes just showing my MTV freaking PA pass just to get into things. And I could because they just saw the MTV logo and they were like, okay, yeah, come. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Totally. So dumb. Yeah. It was like no one, I don't know. It was this weird. It was, and it was such a specific time. Like, I don't think that would even happen today. No. It's a different. Well, it's also, it was also before everyone was famous for something. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like, so it was the, the before the, Instagram. Yeah. Everything's Twitter. been so diluted. And like, there's so many different like levels of fame. Oh, it's a fashion blogger. It's a travel blogger. It's a, you know, it's a TikToker. It's a, you know, so it's like back then it was literally just like movie star, singer. VJ. That was it, really. <laughs> there were even a lot of big, like, radio DJs back then who were, like, celebrities. No, and there weren't really other big TV hosts besides you guys. Like, yeah. now there was, like, like Ryan Seacrest. Like, those big hosts now that didn't even exist. Yeah, but even Ryan Seacrest, like, because I was thinking about that, because there are times where I was like, man, I wish I got the Ryan Seacrest job, but that would have been cool doing American <laughs> Idol. And then I think about it for, like, five seconds, and I'm like, oh, th- no, I had, like, the, like, the rock and roll version of... <laughs> the hosting job where it was literally just like, you know, partying all the time. And, you know, it was such a such a so cool in, experience in that time, though. What was your feeling of not blank enough? Like, why were you so nervous? What were you feeling? Well, when I first got the job and I not think there was a, enough. <laughs> yeah, no, that is it. That is it. And we I think we, you know, to be quite honest, we've, we've said that before. Yeah. The phrase not Carson enough. And, and that is I think that encapsulates it perfectly, because when I got the job, there was definitely a few meetings I had with bosses who were like, now just keep in mind, you know, because I I mean, I'm as white as Carson. I'm as tall as Carson. I am. I was from the radio like Carson. And so literally they were just trying to find the next Carson. And then in meetings, they would tell me, you need to be more like Carson. You know, you need to be more, you know, a little bit more like, I don't know, just like pals with the celebrities. Like you need to, like, hey, like go, go party with Kid Rock or like, you know, get, you know, <laughs> go do this, go do that. And I did. I party with, you know, a bunch of people. It was, it was super fun. But it was like the goal wasn't to, like, get in the papers to, you know. Yeah. And, and I think the, the the higher ups were like, you need to, like, get in the papers and you need to be more carson Yeah, you're not. That's not your nature. I know this. Like, I like we're both terrible at networking and <laughs> yeah. being those people who, like, make the quote unquote right friends. And, you know, certain people are really good at that. And Carson's great at it. He's great at making friends with all the right people. Yeah, <laughs> he's yeah. He's great at being super social. And I feel like... And by the way, I mean, I don't want to sound like... It, 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 if, if this sounds insulting, it's not. It's it's actually... No. A re- it's a skill, right? Yeah. And, so, and I yeah. want that skill. I would love to have that skill. I just, you know, socially... I locked myself in a room for, you know, six years of my like, you know, transformative social years, my childhood. And I just talked to myself in a room doing radio shows. So it's like, I think that kind of stunted a little bit of like my ability to like, hey, what's going on? How, you know, and then of course, there's the self-confidence part. And then there's always the thing in the back of my head at that time, which was, you're not Carson. And then moving on to once like now Carson's gone, you're officially the new host of TRL. And, yeah. you know, I know towards the end of it, you were super confident and it was like you can do that job in your sleep. Yeah, totally. Um, what Was there a feeling of not blank enough there? Did, did anything shift for you? Yeah, probably not satisfied enough. I think it got to a point mm-hmm. where, well, when I got the job, I got the job in 2002. And then in 2004, Craig Kilborn left The Late Late Show and I auditioned to, I did one night there you know, hosting a late night show. And it's all I've wanted to do for, you know, a long time at that point. And so I did it and I felt what it was like a dream. It was like, it was like a dream job. I'm doing my dream job, hosting a late night show. And then I got the week, you know, I was one of the four guys to take over and I thought it was going to happen and then it didn't happen. And so I started to feel like, yeah, there was a part of me that was like not satisfied enough. Like I feel I'm like, I know I'm more capable than, Mm. than what I'm doing on the air. And I know I'm like, funnier than I am when I'm on the air, than I have to be when I'm on the air. And so, yeah, I think it's just not, not satisfied enough. And then of course, like, you know, you, we got together in like my later years of hosting the show. And I always say, you know, the, at that point, you know, when I first started, the money was horrible. And then the last few years, the money was phenomenal, but it was not as satisfying as those first few years. So yeah, not satisfied enough. And then, you know, I'm going to 
fast forward to you get on Twitter, you start using Twitter as a place to tell jokes, which is what Twitter was in the beginning. Everyone like now it's a political nightmare, but before it used to be a place (laughs) everyone went to tell jokes. And a lot of people started like selling shows and, and getting jobs off of these jokes. And you were one of them. Tell tell us a little bit about that story. Yeah. So I joined Twitter and I, like everyone else, I was posting sort of idiotic things that were like totally boring and didn't, you know, have no substance. And then uh, a few of my friends who were comedy writers started posting jokes and there was this little community. And so I started, you know, a little list of comedians on Twitter and said, oh man, I want to start, I want to do that. And I had been writing jokes for in TRL rehearsals for Craig Kilborn's show and sort of like me and this guy, Joel would write monologue jokes and send them in every now and again, we get one on. So I, so I saw this, you know, this joke format, 140 characters. And I became like, Ooh, okay. It was another one of those moments where I was like, Oh, I want to figure this out. I want to get good at this. And let me tell our audience when Damien gets into something, he really gets into something. (laughs) (laughs) It's obsessive. Yeah. Right now it's biking. And right now it's biking. So if you follow him on Instagram, I'm sure you've seen him biking his little heart out. Yeah. So this was like the new thing that you were like obsessed with and getting into. Yeah. I mean, I was on my phone constantly and you were always like, get off your fucking phone. And it Uh, was, you know, and I'm, you know, I don't, you know, not proud of how. And you're still always on your fucking phone. Well, we all are now. I mean, it's just, you can't. I think you're still on more, but we don't have to get into that. (laughs) All right. So you're telling jokes on Twitter. So I tell the jokes on Twitter. And the next thing you know, I get retweeted by, you know, some writers, comedians who, who Seth MacFarlane is following. And then Seth starts retweeting my jokes and then we get invited to his birthday party and to his Christmas party. And I'm like, oh, this is fun. This is cool. And then I remember, you know, a couple of writers were like, hey, you should you should write for the show. You know, you should write for Family Guy. You know, if Seth likes you and you're really funny on Twitter. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. Huh, OK. And I was doing full time radio at the time. Next thing you know, I get a call from my manager at the time and he said, hey, Seth wants you to write for him for the next season of Family Guy. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, it's it's yeah, it's just one of those kind of like right place, right time kind of a thing. And so I've been on the show now for eight years, been writing on Family Guy for eight years now. And you had a similar experience when you first got to Family Guy as you did when you first got to MTV, where you felt like, I think a little bit of like imposter syndrome. What am I doing here? I don't belong here. I'm not a writer. Yeah. I still feel that. <laughs> oh yeah. I've been, I've been, I've been doing the same job for eight years and I'm, I've been doing it day in and day out pretty much every day with, you know, breaks here and there. It's still, there are days where I just leave and I go, they know, your boss knows you're, you're, you know, you you can't do this and (laughs) you're a fraud. You should be fired. And yeah, and it never should have, you know, I never should have left radio. This was a huge mistake. And then there are, of course, days, you know, you have those epic lows and then the epic highs are like, they keep you there, you know, and you're like, wow, this is incredible. I'm, you know, I love doing this. Of course, when I first started and I'd have a good day, I'm like, oh, I drive home and I go, I'm fucking Larry David. I'm a comedic genius. This is amazing. (laughs) You know, I'm a gift to this. And then you have enough days where it's 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 a really cool job in the sense that like, oh, it humbles you like just in in crazy, crazy ways. And then there are days where you're like, yes, I'm the man. This is great. This is going so well. But in in truth now, you know, I've done this for eight years. So I live sort of more in the middle, you know, in bad days. I go, eh, a bad day, you know, whatever. I'm, another There's another show. Uh, there's another day tomorrow for me to to make it up. But what causes that imposter syndrome for you? Do you just feel not funny enough or not smart enough or, or what is it? Yeah, I think all of it. I just feel like like a fake. If I pitch a joke and people laugh and like, that's great. And it goes in the script. I go, I got lucky. You know, it's it, every joke feels like it's weird because it's it's like it's like sort of I've heard this with like songwriting mm. where, you know, Bruce Springsteen mm-hmm. talked about it and Tom Petty, where it's like this magical thing that you don't really have control over. You don't know when it's going to happen. Yeah, when it's going to hit. Yeah, but when it does, it's it's from you, but it's not really, you're not in control of it, mm-hmm. which is a really weird thing because you're like, well, this is my livelihood. Whether I pay the mortgage or like, you know, whether we go on trips or whatever, it's like, oh, this is all dependent on like this thing happening and continuing to happen. Right. And luck- luckily it has, <laughs> you know, over, and I feel like I've gotten better at the job. So there is, you know, a little bit of, there's mechanics to it, I think too, but there's this weird thing where it's like, you can't really think about it too much. You, you get a, sort of afraid of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the thing with most creative jobs, though, especially after talking to so many people on this show. I think most, and honestly, not even just creative jobs, because even when I had, when I had Bob back on here, mm. who's a NASA engineer, granted, there's some, there's definitely creativity that has, has to do with that job. But 
I just think it's such a universal feeling to feel like you're not whatever enough for the job you have. Mm -hmm. And then especially if you're in a creative field, I think then that hits you even more. There's such <laughs> such drastic highs and lows. Totally. When you're like working in television or film or music. It's almost like amazing that we like that, you know, because, you know, we have a very, very good relationship. It's like, but we're both people in creative fields. And so it's literally like days where it's like up and then down and then you're up or I'm down or I'm up and you're down or we're both up or we're both down. Yeah. And it's, it's like, wow. But I guess there's like there's like an understanding. Yeah. Yeah. I think if I was with a teacher, they would probably think I was an insane person or like, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know, but I don't know. I maybe mean, I'm sure teachers have big ups and big downs. I don't know. I think it happens with everyone. But today, Damien Fahey today yeah. in end of the year, 2020, how are you feeling with life, with work? And what is that blank for you now? Maybe not sane enough. Like, I feel <laughs> like it's a crazy time. Things are pretty unpredictable. I think it's sort of like not sane enough. Hmm. Do you think you're insane? Well, not, I mean, you know, not, not like the clinical definition, but, but, you know, I just feel like that everything is so day to day with like this virus and having a creative job on top of that mm -hmm. is added stress. I mean, maybe I'm not calm enough. Maybe I'm not, you know, mm -hmm. maybe I'm not thankful enough. You know, maybe I'm not like grateful enough. You know, maybe these are things that I need to sort of embrace and realize that like, you know, I'm in a really privileged position life is good. And I think there's a lot of times where I'm like, you know, especially out here in LA in, and on Instagram, you see, oh, this person got this, this person got this show, they wrote this thing, it got picked up. And now the, it's like, there's this sort of like constant feed of like, well, what are you doing? What do you, what would you do? What, well, well, you know, what did you just do with this afternoon? And like, why did you, you know, you went for a bike ride, you didn't, you know, write a pilot. It's like, you know, that kind of thing. Not productive enough. Yeah. Yeah. Not productive enough. And just constantly comparing yourself. And I just think it's like, you know, the most super unhealthy and look some you know competitive drive is you, you want to have that but i think you can get overloaded on it and you can just become like i'm worthless useless i don't belong what in this job that i'm doing mm. and so i think stepping back and being like hey that's just a voice you're fine life is good you know yeah and taking stock so well yeah i mean it's definitely been a hard year for everyone definitely stressful and lots of unrest and lots of ups and downs and you know it's hard on people individually it's hard on relationships it's definitely it's been the easiest year for us i had to kick him out of the house a couple of times <laughs> yeah. driving me crazy but yeah acknowledging that you do have privilege as a you know white straight man and what that means and maybe yeah that grateful aspect is really interesting and important and you're only yeah out of the we're gonna have 25 guests this season. Yeah. You are the, what do they call it? Penultimate? Penultimate? Yeah. You're at episode 24. This is episode 24. And you are only the second straight white man <laughs> after Oliver Stark that has been on the show. And you know, Oliver and I had a very interesting conversation about it because often that not blank enough, you know, is related to otherness that a lot of us experience. Mm -hmm. But just because you are a straight white man doesn't mean you don't have those insecurities as well or s different insecurities. But then how acknowledging your privilege is also important. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, well, I don't want this to go viral. So I'm going to be very, very careful. I don't want to say the I, I don't want to say the wrong thing here, but I don't think I have anything controversial to say, by the way, about this. I, I know I'm privileged and I know if I I know that part of what got me to where I am in life is the fact that I'm a straight white guy. So I know that there's like definitely privilege there. I also know that I'm, you know, super hard worker and I really love what I do. You know, when I get into things, I put everything I, I have into it. And so, you know, it, it's a mix for sure with me. But yeah, I mean, you know, I was thinking about while you were talking, I was thinking about like people who get into show business. I feel like there's this this psychology of like once it's almost like a form of escapism, mm -hmm. like you almost like, OK, I, I need to once I, I if I do this, I can escape from this place that I'm in. And so it's sort of like once you get and you escape and you become successful and you get what you sort of have been dreaming of and you experience it and it's amazing for, you know, while it's happening. And then you just sort of like realize things get quiet again and you start to realize, oh, I'm still the same person from 
Springfield, Massachusetts. I'm, I'm, I'm still that kid. Like nothing is, a lot has changed, but nothing has really changed. Like externally, a lot has changed, but I'm still like internally, it's like, well, not too much has changed internally. I still have the same sort of like insecurities. And so once you realize that, once you realize like, oh, you know, writing for Family Guy and I love writing for, you know, I love, you know, the job so much, but it's like, it's not going to make me feel maybe what I thought it would make me feel, you know? Yeah, your happiness and your livelihood and your satisfaction and gratitude have to all come from within. And no matter what you do or succeed at outside of yourself, you know, might give you those little bursts of happiness and and excitement, but then that that fizzles out and you're still left for yourself. And so, and so many of us are just still, yeah, those little eight and nine year old kids that, you know, just wanted a hug yeah, (laughs) or just wanted to feel loved or whatever the case may be. I know. And and as I get older, like, you know, I remember when I was on Twitter and stuff and I'd write jokes about celebrities and stuff like that when they do silly things. But it's like, as I get older, especially with, with therapy and sort of like turning like the mirror on myself and, and like digging into like my insecurities and all the stuff that I dealt with as a kid, like, I just, I feel like, my empathy has expanded in in a really large way. You know, like I'm, I now when something happens to someone or someone says or does something, you know, I still get, I'm like, what, what an idiot, you know, but, at the, but then there's sort of like the, well, why did they do that? And like, consider their experience and consider what they're dealing with. And, you know, it's never just what's on the surface. So yeah, I think it's, it's important to sort of become more empathetic as you, as you get older. Can you at this point in your life, admit that you think you're funny or do you still not think you're funny enough? Yeah, no, I think, no, I know I'm funny. I know I'm funny. I, (laughs) but the thing is, is like every funny person wants to be the funniest person. And I know I'm not the funniest person. And it's almost like, and I've, and I've been dealing with this a lot actually lately, sort of being okay with like knowing I'm really good at like a joke, but I'm not the best at like plotting out a story, you know, for, for like an episode. Mm Mm-hmm. And I've been working on it and I've been trying to get better and better at it. But it's like, it, and every now and again, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll kind of nail it, you know, or I'll get in, on, in a groove, but then it kind of escapes me. And so it's like, yeah, that gives you something to keep striving for. Yeah, for sure. Without, <laughs> but, but, but without like beating myself up and going, you know, mm-hmm. what are you doing? This is all wrong. Right. You're, you know, you're a loser. <laughs> yeah, that kind of a thing. Yeah. You're good at that. You're good at beating yourself up. I know. I know. <laughs> over over like in, anything like you know over like the smallest thing so are we calling this not funny enough or what was the other one not calm enough not calm enough not secure enough yeah not secure nor confident enough yeah not Wait, confident enough is good have that yet hold on there's got to be an episode no we have not have not confident enough oh we don't we don't have not confident enough well it's that's me that's definitely that's you. me, baby. <laughs> not confident been, enough. Not confident enough has been waiting for you. It has. Oh, my. It's like my destiny. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, then we're, we're naming this episode not confident enough because that definitely makes sense. Because I think your imposter syndrome, you're not feeling funny enough. You're not feeling Carson enough, not feeling athletic enough. I think all those things actually really stem from not being confident enough because I would argue you are athletic. You might not, not, you definitely weren't ready for the NBA, but you're not like a klutzy, not athletic person. Okay. You definitely were Carson enough in the sense that you were able to hold your own at TRL. You're definitely funny enough in that you can, you know, put together some great scripts and and jokes. But I think all those things thoughts of not enoughness ultimately come from this feeling that you definitely are not confident enough. And as your wife, I can contest to that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, yeah. Are you sad about that? You sound a little... Well, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I want you to obviously, I I feel like I am confident in in certain areas of my life, but, but I definitely have some areas to, to, to work on for sure. Yeah. Who doesn't? You'd be a little more swagger. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) You, You know, Oh, you should see me in my biking outfit. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tight little shorts. Tight little shorts. A clip-on pedals <laughs> that make you walk weird. <laughs> uh, it'll be fun to see how long this biking phase lasts. Yeah, you. I, I told the guys today, I'm like, oh, my, my, I got the bike. My wife's like, you know, I give it 10 rides and then you never use it again. <laughs> <laughs> no, you've done more than that, though. So oh, I have. Good. No, I'm really loving it. I'm enjoying it. But yeah, you never know. Who knows? I get into, I get into things and then I just kind of go cold on them. 
Yeah. Well, thank you, Damien Fahey. Thank you, Gracie Mercedes. We'll call this not confident enough. And you know what? This wasn't as weird as I thought it was going to be. So not at weird. all. Yeah, it's going to be a little weird when we pass each other in the hallway of our house right now. <laughs> I'll meet you in the kitchen. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye. Okay, so today's afterthought is about being in a relationship, specifically a marriage. During COVID-19 or during the 2020 year of madness, I should say. And so, first of all, it was kind of awkward interviewing my husband. I'm totally going to admit to that. And I think we did okay, (laughs) considering. Um, But it definitely felt different than interviewing anyone else. And like I mentioned in the conversation, yeah, it's been tough. I'm not going to lie to you guys. It's been really tough to be you know, on top of each other since March. And there literally was a time where I said to Damien, please go take a trip, go away for a week so that I can be home alone. And, you know, like, I'm okay admitting that because not all relationships are quote unquote perfect all the time. And we've been together for 13 years now. And this is definitely the most time we've ever spent together. And, you know, I think relationships definitely evolve and there's ebbs and flows. And so for me, I just want, to make sure that we're honest with each other as much as possible. And so that's basically what my afterthought is about, is I would love to hear from you guys and how you've been dealing with or handling relationships in this crazy year of 2020, especially during like COVID lockdowns and restrictions. You know, sadly, I am hearing a lot of people are breaking up or getting a divorce, but then there are some people who are rediscovering each other or they're newer in newer relationships and they feel like this this time has been a great time to really get to know each other. I think there has been examples of things happening across the board for relationships. So if you're willing to talk about it and and leave a comment or even a DM at the Not Blank Enough Pod Instagram page, I would love to hear from you guys. I want to know how you're dealing with your husband or your wife or your spouse or your partner or your boyfriend or your girlfriend. What has this year been like for you guys? I think we had a really good time the first few months. And then after that, it's been kind of ups and downs of feeling grateful to have someone um, to go through this crazy time with and then feeling like, oh my God, I just want some alone time. I also know people have been going through this um, with their kids, which I, I bet is a little harder to admit to. But yeah, that's it. That's my afterthought. I would love to hear from you. Thanks so much for listening. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. Until next time, know that you are more than enough. Check the show notes for links and info about today's guest. Follow us on Instagram at notblankenoughpod. This episode was produced during the COVID-19 pandemic of 2020 and recorded remotely. Our show is executive produced by Gracie Mercedes and Dave Hill and produced by Douglas Sarine and Colleen Beasley. Not Blank Enough is a Gumption Pictures production.